Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Our guest today is Martha Tettenborn, registered dietitian turned health coach. Martha shares her story of discovering a hidden female cancer and how she used nutrition and lifestyle intervention to manage her way through chemotherapy. Her brand new book, Hacking Chemo, explains the process she used to render her chemotherapy treatment relatively benign. She also talks about the book publishing process, which we know is of interest to many health coaches out there itching to write a book of their own. We'd love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at Health Coach Radio. By the way, the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can always be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Our show is proudly brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute, now an accredited educational provider with the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches. This means that our graduates can become eligible to sit for the NBHWC credentialing exam to become a board certified health and wellness coach. Check out primalhealthcoach.com slash level two to learn about our new advanced coaching course taught by me that will nudge you out of your comfort zone, launch you into coaching mastery, and qualify you to sit for the board certification exam. Laura will share a little bit more about what we teach and how at the end of today's episode. In the meantime, let's get on with the show and welcome RD, health coach, and author Martha Tettenborn. Hey, welcome to the show, Martha. How are you today? I'm just fabulous. Thank you. How are you? Well, I'm really excited for starters because you are a fellow Canadian. So we get to pronounce the word process the way we like to pronounce it. I struggle with that on every single episode. So I'm, I'm delighted that we outnumber Laura here. Yes. Laura's going to Laura's gonna have to pronounce it our way, actually. I will do my best. That's a deal. <laughs> um, we have so many things we can talk to you about. Oh my gosh. Like, I think this is going to be a really interesting, varied conversation. I think we're going to cover off a lot of stuff. So I'm excited. We'd love to start by you telling us your story. We kind of call this like the three to five minute speaker bio that gives us a, this total story of kind of where you came from and how you got to where you are right now. Okay. In three to five minutes, huh? <laughs> yeah. Timer's okay. running. And go. <laughs> All right. So um, I've been a registered dietitian for about 35 years. I got into it because I was really interested in health. Um, and I credit some of that to the fact that um, I grew up in a family with a mother who was um, significantly disabled with polio and then ended up getting breast cancer when I was nine years old and went through that process. She had another 10 years, um, died when I was 18. But um, I had thought of, at one point that I was interested in physiotherapy and then I spent a couple of summers at a camp for children with physical disabilities, an East, Easter Seal Society camp, and realized that um, physiotherapists do hands-on care that can inflict discomfort or pain. This is what these kids told me, right? And so it's like, mm, no. So sci the science of nutrition was really just developing in the 70s, and I was really interested in that. And I was one of those teenagers that was always trying to lose 10 pounds or 20 pounds. Um, so I, my mom died in the middle of my last year of high school, and for a while I wasn't really interested in anything. But um, I decided to go back to university for nutrition and become a registered dietitian. So I ended up in university in 1980, which was the year of the McGovern Commission and the U.S guidelines and the whole low cholesterol thing was brand new cutting edge science and you know we were going to be amazing and uh so that's what i was totally indoctrin indoctrinated into and um and what i practiced for probably the first 20 years of my practice um in hospital and as um in private practice and in long-term care and doing home care where i would go around and be the dietitian that could go into people's homes um so i did a, a wide variety of things um and ended up in long-term care um working in gerontology which i love 
um, but it is still very much um, a legislated area where I have to use the Canada's Food Guide and, and you know, nutritional supplement products and things that are part of allopathic Western nutrition medicine. Um, however, I started to be aware in probably about 2006, 2007 of this, this underlying kind of grumble of um, fat not being the devil and um, that there was other ways to approach nutrition besides what I had learned. And it started with um, a little book I found in chapters, which is our version of Barnes and Noble, um, called The Shangri-La Diet. And it was about using flavorless calories, usually in the form of oil, that you would just take as a flavorless shot and it would trick your brain into suppressing your appetite. Now, I mean, it was written by a, a scientist named Seth Roberts, and he had a whole online community, and I was very involved in that for a number of years, but it worked. It, and I mean, I, here I was like sucking back shots of olive oil, you know, it was bizarre. But that's what started me in the down the line of realizing that there was more to nutrition than just what I had learned. And really... I can say that I was not terribly successful at helping people in all those mm. years. You know, the, you, the, mm. the approach to diabetes that involved giving people 50 to 60% carbohydrates and all that kind of stuff. So um, over time, you know, it was within a year or two of that that I discovered Mark's Daily Apple and the Primal Blueprint and that entire community, that forum. I was very involved in that forum for a long time. Um, I was the primal RD, <laughs> um, or, and I think my first post was like a primal dietitian. Are you kidding? Or something like that. Um, and so over time, I realized that I wanted more in-depth knowledge than, and I wanted something that I could actually use as a, um, basis for a private practice in low carb nutrition. And that's when I took the primal health coach, um, certification about three years ago, I guess, three or four years ago, and um, set up a private practice, mostly face to face, because that's what I was familiar with. But I live in a really small community, about 20,000 people. And the family docs here were totally non supportive, totally, mm. like, never got a referral, I could ask um, somebody for to ask their doctor for a fasting insulin level, and the doctors wouldn't know what that was for. Um, it gave me an opportunity for education if they actually asked me, but, uh, anyways, I was not terribly successful as a private practice dietitian doing low carb. The people I did help, I helped, which was wonderful. Um, so all of that was underway. I was still working in long-term care and, um, in the summer of 2018, I discovered I had a very large ovarian cyst, um, I had it removed and it turned out to be cancer. So then I had to go through the whole cancer pathway. And in the process of doing that, of course, me, the, the health and science and nutrition nerd, you know, started into the research and discovered that there was actually an entire uh, field of cancer study looking at the metabolism of cancer. And if you're looking at metabolism, then there's things you can do in terms of, of you know, nutrition to impact that. And that's where things started. So um, I started my blog and eventually I wrote a book and here I am. So <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> yes, that, there's a lot to unpack from that. All right. um, where should we start, Laura? I'm throwing it to you. Where should we start? <laughs> so, I, you know, one of the things that, I heard you say, you know, in your normal course of practice in the allopathic world, you said something to the effect of you didn't really feel as though you actually helped that many people. Yep. Um, and, and we, we actually hear that quite a bit, don't we, Erin, from practitioners coming from that world and, and kind of, but then on the same side, really struggling with other practitioners when you finally decide to put yourself up out there with an alternative path, an alternative solution, you were not welcomed by those in the allopathic space. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. So I guess what I'm, what I'm curious about is, um, you know, how common do you think this feeling really is in the sort of allopathic side of medicine of practitioners really being honest about whether they're actually helping people at this point? Um, I think that allopathic medicine has um, a huge positive impact in certain situations. I mean, mm-hmm. the dietitians who work in an ICU keeping people alive with the tube feeding Mm -hmm. or the people who um, have to deal with, you know, micronutrient balancing for end stage kidney disease are doing really important work and they are really helping people. Yeah. Where we fall down is in the care of chronic disease, the Mm -hmm. kind of lifestyle that what we now call lifestyle diseases, which, you know, we took us a long time to kind of bang our heads against the wall to finally figure out that that's what it was that, that diabetes and heart disease and hypertension and obesity and osteoarthritis and anti-inflammatory or sorry, um, inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases can all be um, traced back to things that are in our environment and our lifestyle, particularly Western lifestyle, Mm -hmm. um, meaning North American lifestyle for, you know, in large part. And, you know, we have, um, exported that to most of the rest of the world at this point, and they're starting to suffer with those things. Those parts of um, healthcare, I don't think we have done very well. Mm -hmm. But there is still very much a set of blinders on um, many, um, many healthcare practitioners that they haven't realized, or they're just starting to realize that there is something else out there. Mm -hmm. Um, dietitians love to talk about being evidence-based, but you know, it takes time for evidence to pile up enough for, um, a change in paradigm. And I think it's coming. Um, I think we're a lot further along that path than we were even just a couple of years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Hugely further along that path. But I mean, I still go to gatherings of local dietitians and I just keep my head down and don't talk really about the fact that I'm, you know, low carb and pushing low carb and stuff. Um, Because the hospital dietitians, some of them are pretty, uh, pretty stuck in their, their own little world. Well, I I believe that we probably have some dietitians listening to this podcast Mm -hmm. because I, what I think I, what I think, or what I hope, I guess, is happening is that, you know, dietitians do this, you know, really um, in-depth degree program, internship, the whole nine yards, and maybe then they go to practice and realize, man, I don't really know how to work with people. So that's maybe we're coaching, getting some coaching. Um, I don't know if coaching is taught in dietetics school. Um, It is. It is. is. Great. Wonderful. Okay. So I guess my question is, and I hope this is like, this is going to be kind of a nuanced question, maybe a little uh, difficult to answer, but kind of what you said there a second ago was like, some dietitians are doing amazing, really specific nutritional programs for people and with very specific, you know, mm-hmm. disease states, but where, 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 where the health consumers getting lost is in this general health, like just promoting general health yet. I, I'm really, I'm really trying to choose my words here. Sometimes we're health coaches. We get a little bit of pushback from dietitians because we don't know what we're doing. We didn't do a four-year degree. We didn't do an internship. We don't, we know it's dangerous. This is a lot of the, the kind of stuff we're hearing that, you know, uncredentialed health coaches shouldn't be giving nutrition advice. I want to know from you, who's a dietitian and a health coach. I mean, you just said it like you go to these networking events and you kind of just button your lip because it's like, they're just not open to it. Um, Is there, I mean, how do we, how do we come together? Do you have, I mean, that's a huge question. I'm going to put that just right on you. Do you think there's a way we can come together, nutritionists, dietitians, health coaches, and communicate with one another? Oh yeah. I I think we have to um, for the, general well-being of people. Um, I think that dietitians as part of the allopathic healthcare system work well for with um, diseased Mm -hmm. states. 
I think that we um, we have a reputation for being rather close-minded and deciding that we're the only people that can be uh, nutrition experts. And I disagree with that. Um, where we fall down is in the area of wellness. And I think that's where health coaches mm-hmm. and you know people in gyms and all that kind of stuff really have a role to play in wellness because there aren't enough dietitians or you know doctors or whatever to do the wellness work let's if we gave them the illness work right get people out of illness and then work on wellness you know like getting from from being sick to being okay and then going from okay to like let's head for fabulous yeah. I want to just, I just want to give a little bit of context as to why I asked you that huge, long, weird question. And I was so uncomfortable asking it because I had a client one time that was also working with a dietitian. I don't know why she was honestly, she just wanted to lose weight. She wasn't a sick person. She just wanted to lose weight. She hadn't had any success with the dietitian. So she came to me because I'd had a successful weight loss program where I'd helped hundreds of people lose weight, which is what she wanted. Mm-hmm. And her dietitian reached out to me and said, Hey, what are you doing? This, you can't do this. This is like, who are you? What, what, what credential do you have? What's you didn't go to school for four years to get a degree in this. I was like, yeah, but I helped her. I actually helped her lose weight. Right. <laughs> and she said, but you have her eliminating all kinds of foods and stuff. I'm like, well, how else do you do it? Like, literally, I, I don't know how, this is what I keep hearing from dietitians is like, all foods fit, la la la. But it's like not really if mm-hmm. you're unwell. Well, that's like, what's been so unsuccessful all this time. Exactly. You yeah. know, it's funny to, to hear. I, I I was immediately like, my eyes got really big when I heard you say something about how you know the, the licensed out, like whether it's dietitians or doctors, are great at working with illness. It's the wellness side of the continuum. And I say this on the phone all the time when people call into our school asking about health coaching and how we navigate these laws is that, look, you are not allowed to work clinically. You're not a clinical practitioner. You're not licensed to treat illness, but that doesn't mean you can't help. And I said, my role as a coach, our role as a coach is to keep our clients 100% focused on wellness. Let their doctor focus on the illness and what needs to be done to treat the illness. But we're going to focus on the behaviors, the habits, the patterns, and the choices that move you closer to wellness. We're not going to focus and fixate on your illness. That's not what we're going to do here. We're going to focus and fixate on wellness because that which you focus your attention and your energy on is what grows. And if you're focused and, and just committed to wellness, eventually over time with the collaborative effort, that illness falls into the background. And that right there, what you just said is exactly how I would differentiate between the two and how these two sides of the coin from the standpoint of health and wellness, right? Licensed practitioners, dietitians, nutritionists, and health coaches can actually work together, right? That's kind of where that falls. Go ahead, Erin. I see you like I know this is so exciting. We're having so much fun. Oh my gosh. Because you know that, that illness wellness continuum, have you ever mm-hmm. seen this? It's, it's a little, it's a, like a little infographic and it's like, we have illness on one side and then it's kind of like health is in the middle, but wellness is on the other side. It's like ill, Ill sick people can be brought to health by the help mm-hmm. of the med- the medical right. system. The and then absence we get, of wellness. We, we I'm get sorry, to, the absence of illness. Absence right? of yeah. illness. And then we, what we want to just don't, st- we don't want to just stop at the absence of illness. We want to take it to that next level wellness. Right. So I think that's kind of like where the baton is passed, you know, yes, come through illness, get to health, and then we'll take it from here because that's, that's our wheelhouse. Yeah. 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 Or you get someone so, who's a dietitian who's also a health coach who can kind of maybe right. take you all the way through. Right. <laughs> that's right. 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 You know, that you, you mentioned the point about the dietitian saying like you're cutting out food groups yeah. okay and I mean I hear this all the time but then I belong to dietitian networking groups of course you know through Facebook and stuff and I can make mention of um, a, a ketogenic diet so a you know very low carb ketogenic diet and I'll get shot down by a bunch of people in that group but someone could put up a post about a vegan diet yeah and make absolutely nobody upset about anything and and yet we get the whole you know oh you're cutting out whole food groups well what the heck do you think a vegan diet is right you know and yet nobody like blinked at mention of a vegan diet in these dietitian support groups and stuff and you know and yet i'm getting blown out of the water so i just 
Yeah, it's you know, inconsistent. I, I, find, I find that there's, um, there, how would I put it? I don't know. It, it's like they've got blinders on. Mm -hmm. And it's like this, this is powerful, powerful medicine, powerful wellness approach or whatever you want to call it. I, I don't like to use the word medicine, but, um, but they didn't think it up. And yeah. maybe that's why it's a problem. You know, yeah. like the, another thing that's really big in the dietitian community right now is health at every size. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And I can agree with that. Totally. Mm -hmm. You can be healthy at whatever size you're at through making better choices. And you might change size because of the choices you make. But that's not the the point. You know, when people come to me and they say, well, I want to lose weight. It's like, okay, what about some other goals? What are your other goals? You know, well, I want my knees to hurt less. Well, I want to be able to, you know, get down on the floor with my grandkids. I want whatever. Um, and so then as we go through the process, they may come to me and they might have lost some weight and they might not depending on how they've been doing but it's like okay so let's you know let's talk about other things oh you know you're not constipated anymore wow you know like <laughs> that's a non-scale victory yeah. your belly's obviously happier with what you're doing <laughs> right um you know you you went out and you did three hours in the garden and you weren't trashed afterwards there you go that's a non-scale victory could you have done that two months ago maybe not you know so you've got to look at the things that improve your quality of life whether or not the numbers change on the scale well that's kind of like we we talk about toward goals and away from goals i think this is a really interesting coaching just tactic you know because people when i think people people get started in a, in a health journey like our clients or our patients they, you know, I want to avoid disease. I want to avoid gain, getting more weight. I want to, I want to get rid of my, my sugar cravings. Like we're talking about the things we want to get rid of and we have no line of sight on the things we want to gain. And it's like, once we start gaining them, it's like, oh, I can get into the garden for hours. Oh, wait a second. I don't have to know where the bathroom is everywhere I go because I don't have IBS flare-ups right. anymore. Like getting people to look toward their vision of beautiful health instead mm -hmm. of just like away from the things that they hate. I think that's a really neat coaching opportunity. Um, and yeah, so I just, that just reminded me of that, but, but I just want to circle back to one thing that you said, and I don't want to harp on this, but I'm just curious when you go into these Facebook groups and you talk about the ketogenic metabolic state, right? <laughs> Surely to goodness, you learned about ketogenesis in dietitian school, right? I mean, like, did you okay. or <laughs> my, my dietitian school was in the early 80s. So we're right. talking a freaking long time ago. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, I have some young dietitian friends who know are not talking about nutritional ketosis. Mm. That's I don't know that that's really even happening. Right. Um, but more like more like ketoacidosis, that kind oh, of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, like I say, that's an illness state. Right. So yeah. okay. um, we all know about that. And that's often all they know in terms of the word ketones, right? Or, you know, ketones are something that your body produces when you're very ill and you haven't been eating and you're getting dehydrated and you get that fruity breath. And like, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's again, the unwell aspect of keto, right. okay. ketoacidosis. Interesting. Um, but the concept of nutritional ketosis being a normal metabolic state I don't know that that's still, or that, that it is even yet really being addressed. That's so weird. Um, now, like I say, my experience with, you know, university nutrition courses is ancient. Sure. So, but I mean, you're, you're networking with, you know, presumably dietitians and all sorts of generational sort of divides. And yep. just, I guess just what, what I mean, what I hear too, is that there's just really sort of like an, a misunderstanding of like ketones generally yeah yeah i believe yeah. that there's a couple of um dietitians in canada who are doing really good work um and uh one is a girl out in bc joy kitty she's about my age and she basically lost 50 pounds and cured her type 2 diabetes using a low carb approach and has a private practice where she does virtual counseling 
Um, and there's a, a girl in um, Toronto. Actually, I think she's moved out of Toronto since COVID happened. Um, uh, Eliana well, Witchell, I think her last name is. And she's a low carb registered dietitian who does virtual private practice as well. And she's been doing, um, she and Michelle Shepard, another dietitian, have been doing some education for dietitians, like through right. our mm -hmm. consulting dietitians network of dietitians right. of Canada, like our official network. They've been doing webinars on low carb nutrition, evidence based, you know, its roles and stuff. And, and they've been fabulous and getting actually um, a really good response. So oh, great. So things are opening up, right? You know, yeah. what I find interesting when you say that dietitians lean on this. Um, well, and I don't think it's just dietitians. It's, I, I think it's anyone in that clinical world about evidence based medicine or evidence based protocols. But my question is, which evidence? Because yes. I am fully aware of evidence that says otherwise. It's as though they're effectively choosing to ignore an entire, like years and years worth of other studies that say something else. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I want to congratulate you and thank you for putting yourself out there, particularly related to cancer, because I think the minute you try to indicate that food and diet can be the answer to navigating this, not necessarily curing it. I'll let you speak to that, but mm -hmm. helping to navigate this process, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> is huge. And then it's from this point of view. So I, if you don't mind, I would love to pivot a little bit into you taking this journey and the type of research that you did, what evidence you found that led you down this path of starting your blog and then taking that blog and, and building a book. So you, so take us back a minute. You're diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Right. Okay. Right? So here's, here's what happened. It involves exercise. Ah, <laughs> okay. All right. I'm all in. <laughs> here's a funny story. It. So I have been a runner since well, I guess I started at about 40. I was raised by a mom with polio. So, I mean, my, my and, and they were older. My parents were not exercisers. I didn't grow up doing exercise. But when I was 40, I started running and discovered I loved it. Well, I started power walking first. Then I started running. Did marathons. Like, you know, you can walk a marathon. Who knew, right? Mm -hmm. Anyways, I've discovered over the years that I really am a non-exerciser who loves to run. That's kind of describes me better than anything. So... A couple of years ago, my girlfriend, one of my best friends from um, elementary school, actually, we get four of us get together every year. And she was training to, um, at a gym for the winter. She was an exerciser all her life. Um, but anyway, she's like 58 and she wants to be what's called a monkey on a racetrack, a motorcycle racetrack. So picture a racing bike on like most board or one of those, you know, racetracks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And some of these motorcycles have a sidecar and a person hangs on to this sidecar which is basically just a platform with a bar and they're fully armored up and they hold on to this thing and they are the counterbalance for the motorcycle oh my gosh she okay, wants so, to I mean, be talk about i know mind blowing right so <laughs> this is what laura wanted to do and so she was training all winter so when i saw her in may i was really impressed and i thought you know what i gotta get back to doing some strength training like look at the pipes on that girl like wow right <laughs> and um so i kind of committed that i was going to get back into doing some strength training and some planks and stuff so in mid-july laura sends me a text message out of the blue and says so what are you up to on your plank because she was going for two minutes right okay and uh i kind of went hmm, she hasn't done one of those in a while so i laid down on my belly on the just on the living room rug just right as soon as i got it and there was something in my belly. There was a lump in my belly that had never been there before. It just felt like I was laying on an egg or something. It was really mm -hmm. weird. And right away, I knew something was wrong, right? So, I mean, I literally sat up in my living room carpet and called my doctor and said, I need to come in. There's something in my abdomen. Um, then my husband came in from wherever he was at and I told him and you know, we both kind of worried about it for a few days. And of course I went straight into Dr. Google and figured that maybe I had a uterine fibroid. I still had all my parts, right? Everything I'd been through menopause, but everything was still there. And um, so by the time I went in to see her five days later, my doctor, I said, oh, I think I've got a uterine fibroid. And you know, 
probably is going to have to come out. And she felt around and kind of went, mm, 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 you know, like, this isn't good, making all these noises and sent me off for a urgent ultrasound, which again happened like about five days later. Socialized medicine is a wonderful thing in that everything is free, but you don't always get it like a half an hour later, like you do in a pay system, right? Yep. So, so anyways, I went off to um, this ultrasound. They took a very long time doing the ultrasound and it, I got the results that afternoon that I had this huge ovarian cyst, like 16 centimeters. Oh, wow. What? Four inches. Yeah. It, yeah, it was huge. And my, my doctor used the word huge three times in that conversation. <laughs> she said the biggest one she'd seen up to that point was about eight centimeters. <clears throat> so um, she referred me to a gynecologist. She said, it's just a big fluid filled sac. The chance of it being cancer is very, very low, but it, you know, it'll have to come out. So off I went to a gynecologist and, and we made a plan that I would have it removed laparoscopically, like just through the little tiny incision, they would just rupture it and pull it out. But it kept growing all summer. It took another two months before I actually had the surgery, being summer, right? Um, and uh, and by the time I had it taken out, I, there was one and a half liters, so that's about one and a half quarts of fluid that they took out of two cysts. So oh they gosh. were, yeah. I was wearing like practically pregnancy clothes. I had to sit with my pants pulled up over the bump in my abdomen, like it was that big. But again, everybody said, like, it's not cancer. It's, it's just a big fluid filled cyst. Well, turns out it was cancer. Six days later, they called me and said, you know, they called and said, uh, the doctor wants to see you. Um, come tomorrow, bring another set of ears. And of course, I knew right away what that meant. <laughs> so, because I work in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so the next morning, we went in, found out that it was cancer. And they sent me off to um, London, which is a big city, three hours from where I live, which is the local um, cancer catchment area, like the local specialist place. So that was sort of the, the start of the process. And they told me that I needed to, um, I needed to, should have chemotherapy simply because they ruptured the cyst to take it out. And it was so big that they couldn't encapsulate the cyst. When they're little, they actually, like, they literally stick a plastic bag inside you, um, kind of take the cyst off of the ovary, put it inside the bag, rupture it inside the bag, mm -hmm. pull it all out like a deflated balloon and nothing um, gets into your system. But mine was too big for that. So, um, so then I had to make a decision about whether I was going to have a hysterectomy and all the rest of the um, standard of care sort of thing. And then I um, was highly recommended to do chemotherapy. Um, the reason for that is that the tumor, it was, it was considered a stage one cancer. And for that, I am so very grateful because um, most people with ovarian cancer are diagnosed at stage three or four. And that's, they call it the cancer that whispers because it has no distinct signs, right? And so um, outcomes tend to be a lot worse at that stage. So it's considered a fairly serious, you know, deadly cancer. But yeah. stage one, 25% of people get caught at stage one. So I was very lucky that way. Um, but as I was going through this process, I went to tell, you know, it's the kind of thing you have to tell people in person, some, you know, some of your friends, right? So I went to tell my one friend's set of friends about it. Um, and she had had breast cancer. So she had been to London and we ended up with the same guy, the same surgeon actually, which was really pretty awesome. He was a terrific guy. Um, but she said to me, and it was one of the defining moments of my, my journey. She said to me, you know, it's like everything in your life up to this point, learning low carb, doing the health coaching, all the, you know, the private practice, the, the whole shift away from what I had been, you know, and, and my personal strengths and all that sort of stuff. She says, it's like everything in your life up to this point has brought you to this point. And you can go forward as like the keto cancer dietitian. Mm -hmm. And I kind of went keto cancer dietitian. I like that idea. And that was kind of where 
I started into, you know, digging into the research and, um, and started the blog so that I, because what I found was just mind blowing. And that is that there is um, a disordered metabolism in cancer. We didn't, I mean, I didn't know that cancer to diet, most dietitians is just something that you support people through. So you help them to get enough to eat despite the side effects of chemotherapy and surgery and radiation and possibly the cancer or the tumor itself. So, I mean, I've helped people with tube feedings if they had a, a lung cancer that impinged on their esophagus to the point where they couldn't swallow, then you support them with the tube feeding, you know, or um, how to deal with nausea and, and diarrhea and, and, you know, raging diarrhea and all that kind of stuff. But here was this whole field of research and there was research, there was evidence published PubMed, go look it up evidence on, um, on cancer requiring huge amounts of sugar in order to grow, right? And requiring lots and lots of insulin in order to grow. And um, there was people doing amazing research. Once I started looking, I found um, people like Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who's mm -hmm. at Boston College and is doing this amazing research on um, where he, they literally took the, um, the messed up nucleus of a cancer cell and put it in a healthy cell. And they took the healthy nucleus and put it in a cancer cell. And what they found is that the, the problems were more in the cytoplasm of the cell or the fluid of the cell than they were in the nucleus. And of course, mm -hmm. everything about cancer that we thought we knew up to this point was about genetics, was about the right. DNA being damaged, right? And what he was saying is, the DNA damage is almost a downstream effect of, um, of this disordered metabolism. Like it's, it's not the root cause. And it was, it was mind blowing to discover that because then what he's suggesting is that you can do things to impact on the metabolism of cancer cells, just like you impact on the metabolism of all your cells by what you, um, what you choose to do, especially in terms of eating and stuff, mm -hmm. right? What you choose to eat. So um, after that, I discovered the work of uh, Walter Longo, who is the researcher at um, in California, who uh, does a lot of work on aging and gerontology, but he also did a lot of work prior to that in cancer and using a ketogenic diet and fasting um, around cancer and particularly around chemotherapy. So what he did was he looked at, first of all, whether fasting impacted, like whether it stressed cancer cells and whether it impacted uh, negatively on your response to chemo. And it doesn't, it doesn't make the chemo any less um, powerful. It actually potentiates its power, it seems. Um, but what it does do, uh, fasting, is it downregulates your healthy cells so that they don't get as impacted by the chemotherapy. And we can talk mm. more about that because that's kind of the crux yeah. of what I was doing. Um, so yeah, these, these researchers have like their, their work was being done at, in the 20, 2000 to 2010, 2014, still being done. Um, so I found all this research and that's when I started kind of Number one, my mind was just blown at the fact that there was nutritional interventions that actually impacted cancer. Like who knew if a dietitian didn't know who knew, right? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, and what can I do for myself? Like, th yeah, this is evidence-based, but completely unknown. Mm -hmm. And it at least seems to be unknown. Nobody around here was talking about it. My right oncologist in London wasn't talking about it. I never did see the dietitians in London. I just kind of figured I could do without that. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, I, I did when I was in hospital having my hysterectomy, I had it in London because of, um, I also chose to have chemotherapy um, put directly into my abdomen. They call it interperitoneal chemotherapy. Okay. So I had to have a port surgically put in not the the port that they usually put up here just to go into your vein but this one was the same port but attached to my rib and it um put a pipe or a tube down into my pelvis that and so the 
the outside of all of my organs down there would be bathed in this chemotherapy. Wow. Yeah, they pumped like two liters of fluid into me. It was a little uncomfortable. But, wow. So you, yeah. you did chemotherapy and yeah. used a fasting protocol as an adjunct alongside of it. Okay, well, tell I us did. about that experience. Um, so this was, again, based on the work of Walter Longo, he had actually published a paper in 2009 that was a series of case studies where he had um, used fasting in combination with chemotherapy. So people would, um, there was 10, about 10 cases in the, in the paper. And so people would fast prior to their um, chemotherapy and then for a period after their chemotherapy. And some, some cycles they did, some cycles they didn't. Everybody was different. So he reported each one differently. Um, and then he would um, observe their side effects and their own perception of their side effects. And they have significantly less side effects when um, they did the fasting. And of course, chemotherapy is a poison. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what it is. The idea is that it's poison enough to kill the cancer cells without killing the host, yeah, right. right? So you feel like crap while you're going through it. And that's because it's, it's poison. <laughs> so if you can, um, if you can make the chemotherapy only focus on the cancer cells, you'll come through it with less collateral damage. And that's what the fasting does. Um, when, you bought, when you fast, you actually um, put your own cells, your, your whole normal metabolism goes into a quiescent state or a quiet monitoring sort of state. You know, we're, we're designed that we can withstand periods of no income in, or no intake. Mm -hmm. If we weren't, we would have all died back on the savannah, right? Yep. So we have, you know, things that are non-necessary, just quiet down. Mm -hmm. And so when you put your healthy cells into that quiet mode, what it does is it makes the cancer cells, which have no quiet mode. One of right, the right. basic hallmarks of cancer is that it is always in growth always in a growth phase, always on, cannot turn off, right? No off switch. So chemotherapy are drugs that are targeted at fast growing cells. Okay, so they're a fairly blunt weapon. Um, they look for fast metabolizing cells and that's what they damage, okay? So if you can make your healthy cells not so fast metabolizing, they quiet down, it's like they go into stealth mode <laughs> and they are kind of bypassed. They become invisible to the chemotherapy, right? Wow. Yeah, it, it is, it's a wow. wow. Um, the other thing is that because they have no off switch, cancer's desperately looking for um, sugar and like for fuel. Yeah. And if you are in ketosis, it can't use ketones. Right. right? Um, it needs sugar and it needs to burn it in a, this disordered, very ancient form of metabolism called fermentation or, or um, cytoplasmic fermentation. So in other words, it happens in the, the cytoplasm of the cell. Mm -hmm. And so these, these cells are really hungry for um, sugar and for insulin, like an insulin-like growth factor and all the things that allow sugar to get inside the cell. And so your, your keto diet and your fasting have put you in ketosis, which means that your healthy cells have fuel, but the cancer cells do not. So they're already stressed, which makes right. the chemo more powerful, right? So he, you know, I had read this case study and thought, dang, I'm going to try this. Now, I, I'm a firm believer in the N equals one experiment. And of course, I'm the one. I refused to be the control for my own experiment. In other words, I refused to do a cycle where I didn't fast because I really didn't want to put myself through that. Right. Mm -hmm. Not a sucker for punishment, right? So all six cycles that I had, I did the full fasting. I did a, a 72 hour fast okay. where I fasted for two days or 48 hours before um, chemotherapy and then 24 hours after. Um, and uh, you know, it wasn't a water fast. I used bone broth and coffee and tea, um, water, bubbly water. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of bone broth, maybe um, 
about four cups mm -hmm. per cycle sort of thing. But, wow. Wow. Yeah. So I, I mean, I had, what's the book? It was, it, is it yeah. the truth about cancer? Is that the name of the tripping book? over the truth, tripping over, over the, the truth. truth. That's yeah. it. So I, I listened to that audio book and was blown away mm -hmm. uh, with the whole history and the whole Warburg effect and how it's yeah. just gone completely disregarded, even though the treatment of cancer, the way we're doing it now is not working, right? Not to the degree that it should be working if that was really how to do it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, and so I had, I understood the notion that healthy cells can use ketones, but unhealth, the, but the cancer cells cannot. I, I didn't realize about the role of fasting, probably because that book doesn't really go into that detail, right? It spends mm -hmm. most of the time talking about the history of kind of how we got here and yeah. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this. So tell us a little bit about what that experience was like going without food for these oh. days around your keto treatment and, and like, just like psychologically, what's that like for you? Are you just a different place emotionally knowing that this is part of your treatment oh, rather yeah. than, yeah. Yeah. It, I didn't find it hard. Um, I was, I, as soon as I started, I mean, I've always followed kind of a primal, mm -hmm. you know, low low carb. Um, I had just come through Christmas, so it wasn't totally low carb. Um, I started my chemo in, in early January, but I went strictly keto as soon as Christmas was over. And mm -hmm. so I was in ketosis and I have a blood meter. I was making sure I was, you know, at least mildly in ketosis all the time. Um, so my chemo treatments were on Thursdays and um, every three weeks. And because of the fact that I live three hours away, we would do my clinic visit and my labs and the chemo treatments, which was two different parts. One part was IV, one part was into my abdomen. I was about 10 hours in the cancer clinic every time I went, right? Um, so I would stop eating on Monday evening. So I'd have dinner Monday evening. And then, um, Monday evening? no, Tuesday evening. Losing, losing track. Yeah. Tuesday, yeah. Evening. Tuesday evening, I'd have supper and then all day Wednesday, I would fast. And then Thursday, um, Wednesday evening, we would drive to London because it's winter in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And so it generally, you couldn't count on the weather. So we'd go down the night before because I had to be at the clinic by seven in the morning, stay in a hotel, um, spend all day Thursday in the clinic and then drive home Thursday night. And then all day Friday, I would fast. And then Friday supper time, I would have my first meal. Okay. So I had bone broth made always. I, I defrost about a liter of bone broth so that I had enough for a couple of days. Um, and I just, I would use black coffee. I drink coffee every morning anyways. I am never very far from my thermos. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh I'd have coffee in the morning. I'd have maybe a cup of bone broth at lunch on Wednesday because um, I was still working on that Wednesday usually. And I work in a long-term care facility and I would have lunch at a table with other people. So if I took in my bone broth, I could just heat it up. And in fact, I could even eat it with a spoon if I wanted as opposed to drinking it just so that it looked like I was having a normal. normal. <laughs> yeah. And they knew what I was doing, but I mean, at least it wasn't weird you right. know, that I was sitting there not eating. Um, and then I'd come home and we would get in the car and drive to London. Um, and I'd have a thermos of tea with me and I would bring my bone broth. And, and once we got to the hotel about eight or nine o'clock, I would drink my bone broth and that would be my supper on Wednesday. Thursday, I would just have coffee. Um, once you're in chemo, you really don't feel like eating anything. No. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a great, inducement to having a good appetite <laughs> everything they offer you in the chemo suite is sugar oh my gosh, right? yeah, crazy. every half an hour some sweet little old, old volunteer you know senior citizen comes around with two baskets and one is full of like pig cream cookies or some sort of you know plain shortbread cookies in the little individual two packs and the other one is full of like werther's butterscotches mm -hmm. or something you know candies but I mean, that's what people want, right? Mm -hmm. You know, your mouth is dry um, and they're, they're bland. And they, um, and if you ask for a drink, of course they always have water, but I mean, they always have ginger ale too, because ginger ale settles people's stomachs, right? 
is the theory. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess, I guess it comes down to like, what's hard. I mean, like, I, you know, this is the big question. Like, is it hard to fast for 72 hours? Well, I think having really terrible outcomes from chemotherapy is probably harder. So what were your, so what were your, what was your chemotherapy experience then? Like relative to what, you know, maybe other people were having. It was pretty freaking awesome. Really? Wow. I mean, chemo is never fun. It is. No, right. Um, you know, I, I had, one chemotherapy called uh, paclitaxel put in through an IV in my arm. That took a couple of hours. Um, and then the second one, um, carboplatin was put into the chemo port into my abdomen. So just the physical sensation of having two liters of fluid pumped or drained actually into my abdominal cavity made me feel all bloaty and wolf. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So um I never felt great when I was done, but I wasn't nauseous. I was never nauseous. Um, I was thirsty. So we just generally stop at a coffee shop or something on the way home and get another thermos of tea or something. Um, The next couple of days were low energy is sort of how I described it. Um, I mean, I could get in the car with my husband and we'd go maybe into Home Depot and pick up something. And if I got tired, I would go sit on a bench somewhere and wait for him to, you know, get the paint can shook up or something. Um, But I never missed a meal. I never missed making the meals because in in this Mm -hmm. house, I'm the one that makes the meals. I'm in control, control freak. (laughs) Um, And sometimes it was just bacon and eggs, but you know, I made all the meals. If I felt like I was, you know, bored, I'd get out of my recliner and I would go and I'd empty the dishwasher or I'd switch laundry or, you know, whatever. Um, And then when I was tired, I climbed back into my recliner. So the first couple of days I might nap for, you know, a half an hour once or twice. And I never nap, never, 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 never. So, I mean, this was Mm -hmm. an indication that I was really low energy. Um, the third day was usually the one where I had maybe a little bit of nausea enough that I would maybe take one Stematil, which is a, a as needed type anti-nausea drug. I might take that once, um, usually about day three, which would be like Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. Um, by Monday, my energy was starting to come back up again. And by, um, by the end of that week, I was back at work, basically normal. Dang. Wow. And then I had two weeks of pretty well normal before it started again. Right. So can you walk us through nutritionally during this time period, how you ate when you weren't receiving treatment, right? Those three weeks in between versus work, like, like navigating your way and preparing to fast. And, and how is that cycle different? Did you just try to stay in ketosis? Otherwise, were you on a ketogenic diet in between, but eating what you wanted? Tell, tell us about that. Yes, I stayed strictly keto um, in ketosis for the entire time of the chemotherapy, which is stricter than what what I normally live. Mm -hmm. Um, I ate eggs, meat, vegetables. Um, I I used some low carb breads that I made myself usually, um, like the low carb acacia bread and Mm -hmm. things like that. I did a little experimenting with low carb crackers and low carb um, granola and stuff, but oh my God, that granola is crack. Uh, <laughs> in fact, in, in the book, I call it crackola um, <laughs> because I just I ate way too much of it. Uh, it's all sweetener and, and uh, nuts and seeds mm-hmm. and, it's, yeah. and I love crunch. So yeah, but no, I stayed in ketosis the entire time. I did not have an alcoholic beverage that entire time. Um, I just, everybody knew that that's what I was doing. You know, I, we still socialized and, and stuff, but there was, you know, there was no booze and, and no carbs and, you know, almost no carbs. Um, but I don't, I didn't find it hard. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't hard. I mean, it, it's, it's about that paradigm, it's about that mind place. And like, like Aaron said, like you choose your heart, right? right? Suffering through the, the side effects of chemotherapy is hard. Yeah. And I didn't want that hard. Mm-hmm. So this was not hard. 
No, I think, I think it's important just, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question or maybe put a comment out there, but before I do, I just want to remind everybody that this is not medical advice, um, but it does, t- we know it takes, so for a person coming from a, what is called a standard American diet, it takes a good three weeks to become keto adapted. Mm-hmm. Because what you want is you, you, you were talking about, you want your healthy cells burn in ketones because yeah. the cancer cells can't. Mm-hmm. But that's a good three week endeavor to go from like zero to keto adapted. So somebody right. who's going to maybe try this out needs to have that kind of strategy in place. And then once you are keto adapted to your point, you just want to kind of hang out there for a while, make sure that you're fully, fully efficiently burning ketones. Like it, it's not worth it to, to jump in and out of ketosis when that's really your main anti-cancer strategy, right? Yeah. So in the book, when I wrote the book, I did that. I, I did sort of a, a ketosis primer, right? right? And chapter one is, or the first part of it is like the first three weeks, this is where you start. And it brings you down into, you know, the 50, 75 sort of gram range. So there's still sweet potatoes and carrots and, you know, some of the, and maybe a few legumes and a few of the higher carb vegetable foods. Um, and then from there you move into ketosis. So, and, and that's exactly what I said. Like you can't go from zero to a hundred. You have to, you have to build the metabolic machinery to burn fatty acids and to burn ketones. Mm-hmm. And that takes a couple of weeks. Right. And, you know, we talk about carb flu and all that kind of stuff that you may or may not go through in that process. So yeah, that's the, that's the way the book is set up as well. Here's how you start into um, a low carb diet. Here's how you move into ketosis. Um, yeah. We should talk yeah. about the book. We should segue mm-hmm. into the book. Sure. So tell us what it was like writing a book. There oh, it is. <laughs> I want an only hard copy so far. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. So I started writing a blog. Um, I called it Powerful Beyond Measure. And that comes from a uh, Marianne Williamson quote that says we, you know, our greatest fear is not that we're insignificant, but that we're powerful beyond measure. Mm-hmm. And that, um, that takes response. You have to take responsibility for your own power. Right. So, and originally I thought that's what the book was going to be called too. When I started writing it, that's what the book was called. But um, so I started writing the blog partly because when I realized I had ovarian cancer, I went looking for stories. I wanted to read other people's experience. I wanted all the nitty gritty details. And I wanted to hear it from people of my own age and stage in life, mm-hmm. right? But what I found most, there was a few, but what I found a lot of was that, you know, the internet tends to be more of a young person's comfort mm-hmm. zone, you know, and particularly YouTube and video blogs and all that kind of stuff. So there was lots of young people going through breast cancer, ovarian cancer, you know, chemotherapy was kind of what I was really aimed at. Um, And so I really struggled to find people of my own age, postmenopausal, you know, but healthy women who were dealing with this kind of stuff. And I really wanted the stories. So part of this was putting my story out there so that other people could find it Mm -hmm. because I know that that's what I wanted at that time. Um, And then also, once I figured out that there was this nutritional aspect to cancer that I as a dietitian hadn't even known about, and that it could be so powerful. um, I mean, I was I was pissed off that this stuff wasn't out there. (laughs) Yeah, I was kind of like angry that nobody knew about this. So that's when I started again, you know, blogging about that as well, but deciding I was going to write this book. And, and people would, you know, friends would read my blog and go, you know, you're a really good writer. You should write a book. Okay. Yeah. So I started working on it. You know, I, I, I had a couple of sort of mentors um, and I just kind of threw together an outline one day to, you know, that kind of, what do they call it? Brainstorming type, you know, yeah. stream of consciousness stuff, got it all down on paper, put it out there to a couple of people. And they kind of went, you know, that would make a really good book. So I started working on writing it and I got the writing part finished um, last February or so and uh, sent it off to a couple of people that I trusted, one who had a really strong medical background, a couple actually, they both had a strong medical background, um, and my daughter-in-law who has 
a grad, she's a graduate of a writing program at the university and has edited books and stuff. So, um, and sent them off, but no medical background. So I sent them off to those two people and, and sort of assumed that that was going to be, you know, my editing process. Then, oh my God, then you start getting into how to publish a book, Kindle yeah. versus, you know, Kindle University. And, and I just got lost. So I realized that that was not a good use of my time or my energy. And I ended up um, watching a lot of videos from a, a woman who runs a book self-publishing coaching company called Book Launchers. Her name's Julie Broad. She's Canadian. There you go. <laughs> um, she lives in Los Angeles now, but she's a Canadian. So she had um, this company that supports authors to self-publish. She provides the editors and the designers and the distributing network information and the promotion and all like the whole thing. Um, and so I decided to sign up with her and it's the best decision I ever made. Oh my Lord, the, the, the help that I've had from that organization, the, you know, it turns out there's like three different kinds of editing. Like who knew? Um, and, and design work, designing the front cover, the back cover, the interiors, the layout, the, um, you know, designing web pages, designing the promotions, how to put it up on all the different platforms so that it can be distributed widely. Um, and then what book launchers had was the Canadian aspect as well, because she had published in Canada herself before starting this company. And so she knew the Canadian market as well as the American market. And um, so it's been a heck of a process and I have been open to all of the suggestions. Like, I mean, they came to me and said like, so how stuck are you on your title? Would you consider, you know, some ideas around your title? And I went, yeah, like go for it. <laughs> um, I wasn't, you know, the powerful beyond measure meant a lot. That term meant a lot to me. But one of the things I really, really learned through this process was that the book is not for me. Right. The book is for my reader. And so you have to first identify your reader. You really closely have to, you know, drill down to who is your target reader. And then you have to write to them, not just for yourself. Um, and you have to have something that's going to benefit them like they call it a hook like what is it that's going to sell your book right okay. but but you're there you're not there just for yourself you're not there just to tell your own story you're there to benefit them and so everything was you know how do we benefit them so then they sent me a bunch of ideas for titles none of which resonated with me terribly but I had this what I call my brain trust which was a bunch of girlfriends my, my church knitting group who were another <laughs> bunch of girlfriends, all kind of my own age. And that's my target audience is like mm -hmm. women dealing with ovarian cancer, right. Or, or dealing with cancer and particular chemotherapy and, um, and my daughter-in-law and a few, you know, a few other people. And so I sent this list of titles out to them. And I said, what I really need you to do is rank it one, one to three, your top three, and then tell me which one is an absolute dud, like which one you would never, you know. So I, I got half a dozen replies at least. But my kids, bless their hearts, my, my son and his wife, they went to the dog park and they spent an hour and a half walking through the dog park with that piece of paper with the titles discussing my book Aww. and came back to me with a whole list of we these are the things that we think your title needs to um needs to communicate you know that you're not curing cancer okay. you're not um in fact you're not even just dealing with cancer in general you you know this is about chemotherapy this is about a nutritional hack a nutritional modification that impacts chemotherapy right and so i took everything that they had thought of and put it in my brain and went for a three hour bike ride. Okay. And by the time I got back from that three hour bike ride, I had my title. Amazing. There you go. And I, you know, typed it off, sent it off to book launchers and they all came back and went, we love your title. It's perfect. Hacking so, chemo. Hacking chemo. So the idea of biohacking. Yeah. Right? yeah. And chemo, it. not cancer. It's about chemo. Right. 
right? Yeah. And then the subtitle, using ketogenic diet, therapeutic fasting, and a kick-ass attitude to power through cancer. That's like, gosh, I love you know, it. It's not a battle. I'm not in a battle. You know, I'm not a victim. I'm in control of this. And part of the book is about attitude and about your social network and about connecting to spirit and experiencing gratitude through, you know, what would otherwise be a negative process, right? So I needed to get all that in there. And, and I did, I think. So. Yeah, you know, oh my it. gosh, I love it. And I mean, I just, I'm so excited for you, you know, that I just, I just feel like you kind of found your place. And your oh, yeah. calling and your passion, like this is, you know, we have a lot of health coaches that really struggle with this, really struggle with finding who they are as a coach. They don't want, they want to help everybody. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they end up helping nobody, nobody because they're not resonating with anybody. And boy, is this super niche? But I, I can tell you, even though you have like this one person in mind, right? This woman in your age group with ovarian cancer going through chemo, I think anybody who loves someone going through chemo, who is going through chemo, um, just in general wants to be able to support this demographic, yep. this book would be perfect for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the the sort of attitude part of this. I don't care what type of health coach you are. It's our role to empower our clients to feel badass and to begin to trust their own intuition and endeavors that they can do this regardless right. of what the goal is. So right. I'm just super excited for you. And I can't wait to see this thing go flying off the shelves. And I can't wait to see you out there marketing yourself as the keto chemo, chemo coach. <laughs> That's a mouthful, you know? So I, you know, how can we help you? How can our listeners help you kind of spread this word? Where can, should they check out your blog? Certainly the book, but Tell yeah, us more so about the, that. the book is available on Amazon. Um, it's also available on um, Barnes and Noble and a variety of independent bookstores. And uh, in Canada, chapters.ca um, has the book available. So it's not in bookstores yet because I've only been released for two weeks. Um, so that will hopefully come with time and with exposure. Um, I did want to say though that 10 days before I published Jason Fung's new book, you know, Jason Fung, mm -hmm. right? the obesity code, the diabetes code, yeah. his new book called the cancer code was published on November the 10th. Oh. Okay. Now I knew a year and a half ago, he was writing a book about cancer, which is just the coolest thing. Yeah. Right. Um, he's a, for anyone who doesn't know, he's a Canadian nephrologist who has really, got his mind around the concept of intermittent fasting and ketosis and um, and cellular metabolism and root cause medicine around diabetes, obesity, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So his newest book is about cancer and it is a mind blowing read. I, I had ordered it as an audio book. It arrived like noon on the 10th. I started reading it. I had it done three days later. And I'm currently working my way through it again because there's just so much information there about the par the actual paradigm. As you said, everything about cancer has been about genetics, about mm -hmm. this what they call a somatic mutation theory, um, that that cancer is caused by genetic mutations. And everything since we discovered DNA has been focused in that direction, and it's been unsuccessful. It's been wrong. And so what he is doing is looking at the evidence for um, paradigm, what he calls 3.0, which is an evolutionary um, look at what cancer is. And it has so helped me to understand deeper the sort of what cancer is, why it happens, but also that what I am doing is right. Yeah. That there's nothing that he says in his book that doesn't support what what I've actually put into practical terms in my book. His is very theoretical. It's not a how to solve cancer um, book. It is not aimed at an individual in terms of what you can do or anything like that. It's a, you know, more of a theoretical read. Totally worth, totally worth the time. Yes. But mine is, 
is more practical. Mine is like boots on the ground. How do I, as a person going through chemotherapy or, or supporting a person going through chemotherapy, how can I make real differences that are going to really impact how I get through? And so the books really um, complement each other. Yeah. Um, I did a blog post about his book because I just, and I left him a review on yeah, Amazon. It was just amazing. So good. good. Anyways, the other thing is that if anybody does buy the book, read the book, um, if you would please, please, please review the book mm-hmm. yes. because that's how book visibility works is that, you know, there's sales, but then there's also reviews. And so an honest review on the book um, is the greatest gift you can give any author. So absolutely, um, love it. I'm also so- on Facebook. Um, okay. Powerful Beyond Measure is the name of my Facebook page that actually follows the cancer journey. Um, and my website is marthatettenborn.com, all lowercase. So the blog's there and um, links to um, links to the book and stuff. Wonderful. Wow. Oh my gosh. I feel like this could go another hour, favorite lady. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we don't have the time. <laughs> well, oh my thank- Lord, it is. Yeah. <laughs> no. Honestly, congratulations, Martha, mm-hmm. and on every like just everything. Um, it's a great, it's a just an inspiring story. I'm feeling inspired. Uh, you're an inspiring person. Thank I'm you. grateful that you managed to get through. You managed to kick chemotherapies, but and yeah. got really this so book. Good, yeah, you get this book out there, and it can help a lot of people. Uh, that's really what I want to do. I just want to give it back out to the universe. You know, that's so so important. Yeah. yeah awesome. awesome. I think you're uh, nothing but up from here for you. And, um, like Aaron, I, I just want to thank you for putting yourself out there. Um, you know, I, from touching back to something you said earlier about how sometimes you go to these dietetic meetings, just put your head down. Cause you just don't want to deal with the argument. You know, um, the fact that you put yourself out there like this, um, I just think is uh, brave. I've and got courageous. to do my own community though. You know, yeah. you know, there's this biblical passage that says that, you know, Jesus was never um, recognized in his own community because he was like the carpenter's son, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, how could you be the son of God? Um, it's that sort of thing that, you know, within my, I've got to be able to step up and I haven't approached my local newspaper yet to say, you know, here, you have a new local author. I've got to do those things and kind of put myself out in my own community. Yeah. No, um, I mean, and look, I think there's a lot to be said for being able, you are your own truth statement. It's hard to deny the success of what you're suggesting. So first of all, how could it hurt, right? It's not gonna be harmful. Um, If anything, it can make things better. And you are your own walking truth statement. You're your own walking proof of efficacy here. So, um, and and look, I don't don't think you need to convince everybody. I, I think it's just, getting a couple of people at a time to open their eyes and, and pay attention and be open-minded. Well, actually a a really good sort of like closing note might be like, we talk about this evidence-based practice. We kind of Mm -hmm. touched on that earlier. And, but there's three prongs to an evidence-based practice that people forget about, right? Right. First of all, there's the, there's the, um, the evidence, the research, that's one prong. Then there's the clinical experience. Like Mm -hmm. I put it into practice and it worked. And then third part is patient values and patient preference. People only kind of focus on the research and you can cherry pick research, but we have to, we have to look at this from a, a, a broader sort of view. And so you have, there's, there's research to support it, your clinical experience in it worked and it, it was, it was doable. It was easy for the patient. That's, that's evidence-based just so and I've, I've helped a few other people through this as well. Yeah. You know, kind of coach them through the fasting and, and stuff. And it has worked for them too. Yep. So. You should have them write some testimonials that you can, if you know, you can maybe add to the digital copy or add to your website. I'm sure you're going to do all that, but um, yeah. 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 Them, well, they, they've reviewed the book for me, um, yeah. but it's another dietitian thing that it's not really recommended that we use testimonials. Oh. Well, health coaches are allowed to do that though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so there, so there, you're not just a dietitian. You're also a health coach. So that's right. 
Yeah. Awesome. All right, Martha, we will support you as best we can. Thank you so much for your generosity and your bravery and spending time with us today. I've learned a lot. So thank you. Oh, and thank you for having me. And thank you for being so um, warm and welcoming to an absolute newbie, nervous newbie. Um, <laughs> I so appreciate you making this really comfortable for me. Oh yeah. You would never have known it. You would have think this was your hundredth podcast. No problem. Oh, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Martha. All right. Take care, you guys. Thank you. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening. Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of, and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 Certification Course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach Certification Course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change, goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again. Your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills, and maybe dial up your credential and become a board-eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's Level 2 program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level 2. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board-certified coach, book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844-307-7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.